Good morning. Good morning, Christ Church. Let's go ahead and stand this morning.
Good morning, good morning. Perfect love casts out all fear. We're gonna sing about that right now. As we enter into God's presence together with each other. So let's sing about the great love of God together. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know oh, I won't be shaken oh, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance that together this morning to be reminded of God's love for us, right? And as we sort of gather in this, this big space here, a lot of people that we know and we don't know, uh, it's a great reminder for us that when we come to God's throne, uh, we can come with confidence, as Paul said, to approach his throne with grace and confidence because of what Jesus has done. And we're gonna sing about what Jesus has done for us here in just a moment, the suffering that he endured to remember that, to center our hearts on it and be reminded that we shouldn't take any of this for granted, right? And that when we come together to sing, uh, we're not just coming as a solo individual 
uh, to express a solo thought. We were expressing a church thought. We were expressing a, the heart of the church, the heart of the Bible, the heart of the gospel together in one voice. And so it was very special. So you made it all this way. You made it all this way here this morning. Give it all you got as you sing. Give, it all, give the Lord your heart this morning so he can speak to you and teach you and minister to you. So let's go ahead and sing this to remember that Jesus bled and died for us, for our sins. Amen. Son of God, in all his innocence, you're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, oh, blood and how can we is a God who weeps, is a God who pleads, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of suffering. And so our distant enemies, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. Into the sin you embrace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end the proof is in your wounds. Yes, in the
Uh, would you join me in a word of prayer? Jesus, Son of the living God, Son of suffering, we stand before you this morning and we acknowledge your presence in this place. And God, I realize in a room full like this, there are people with hearts that are full. There are people that hearts that are hurting. God, there's people with questions and doubts. God, there's people that have barriers or things that keep them from you. I pray, God, that you would meet us where we are this morning that you would speak your words of truth, your words of love. God, may you just fill this place so much with your presence and power that at the end, we can only look at each other and say, only God. And so God, we surrender these moments, these minutes to you. We pray that, that your power, your presence would be on display, God, and that you would speak. And so God, I, I just ask for your favor and blessing over each and every one in this place. And I pray in the only name that we can pray in, in Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Christ Church. Go ahead and be seated. It's so good to see you this morning. If I don't know you, my name's Greg. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here. If you're new or newer and, uh, and you love to get connected, the easiest way to get connected at Christ Church is to take your phone and on the chair in front of you, there's a little tag. And if you hold your mobile device there, it'll bring up a screen. And, and we would love to get you connected here at Christ Church. We're, we're all about this idea of, of following Jesus. Jesus is the teacher. Jesus is the rabbi. Jesus is the leader of our life and so we are disciples of his and so we're all about following him and so we would love to help you right in fact Jesus's final words to his followers many of you are familiar with these words right he says he says go in and make disciples and then he's, there's kind of two parts of one is baptize and it's this idea of right that people that are far from God people that don't have a relationship with Jesus like let's help them discover who Jesus is right and we, in the beginning of the journey is baptism and then he says baptize them and he says teach them to what obey he says teach them to obey so the idea that those of us who are followers of Jesus that our responsibility right our our role is to continue to follow him and be changed by him and transform him just following what he teaches us to do and, and that's what we're about. And so any way we could help you be on that journey, we'd love to do that. I also want to just say a big, big shout out, big thank you to those who are part of the Christchurch family, man. Your generosity is, is awesome and it's inspiring. And because of your faithfulness, because of your generosity, because you continue to give to the mission of the church, there's so many things that are happening. In fact, this morning, right, we're in this room and you can see this. Uh, obviously, there's kids ministry happening. There's students that are gathering uh, this morning. There's more students that'll be gathering tonight. Uh, we got people over in Fleming, whereas we're launching a church in Fleming Island. We got people up in River City. This morning, we, we, we got a team that's helping launch a chapel service up at NAS. There's a team of people from Christ Church down in Southwest Florida helping plant a church in Southwest Florida. Uh, in fact, and there's people meeting in prisons right now. Do you know this? This year alone, we've baptized 72 people in a prison ministry this year. And that's because of you and your generosity. 
Uh, because of your generosity, uh, the over 1,400 prisoners have been gone through our, our discipleship pathway that we're taking them through. And so it's because of your generosity and so many things that we're doing. Even next week, we'll have some of our friends from First Coast Women's Services will be here. And we're, we're one of their, their biggest sponsors. So God is doing some great things. So thank you again for continuing to give. And it's easy to give, right? You can give online through the device. There's all these giving boxes around through the foyer and out in the atrium. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're, we're continuing our journey as we're going through the book of Revelation. We're looking at the, the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And so today we're going to be uh, looking at Revelation chapter 3. So Bible, if you have your Bible, go ahead. Now is the time to pull it out. Revelation chapter 3. If you have your workbook, go ahead and get that ready. And we're going to dive in and see what God is teaching us uh, here. So check out this video. And then Pastor Jason will be here to teach us from the Word of God. If you knew the future, what would you change? How would you live differently? Would you save yourself from hurt and heartache? Or would you repeat the same mistakes? Can we learn from the future by visiting the past? The Apostle John received a revelation from Jesus, a glimpse into the future, an unveiling of things to come, and lessons that are not just valuable, but life-changing. Are you ready to transform your life? Have you ever started a project? Maybe it was a project at home or in the garage, or maybe it was a project online, or maybe it was a project somewhere else, and you started well. Man, you had plans, you had details, you jumped in the first couple weeks, you gave it your all. But then something happened along the way. I don't know what it might have been. It might have been you got distracted by something else, or maybe you got busy, maybe you weren't feeling well, or maybe it was just the, the kind of the journey of life. But somewhere along the way, that project that you started well, the project you started with great anticipation, this project you started and you're looking forward to finishing, now you're no longer finishing it. Now every time you walk in the garage, you see that project and go, oh, I gotta get back to that. You know, every time you jump online, you see that, or every time you go to school, or every time you go in the office, you're reminded by that unfinished project of something that you started, but you have yet finished. Now, no elbows in here, all right, because we all do this. We all start well sometimes, but sometimes we don't finish well. And so today, as we jump into this fifth church, look at the city of Sardis, that's going to be their story. They are a church that started well. But somewhere along the way, they took their foot off the gas and they are not finishing well. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to uh, Revelation chapter three as we look at the city of Sardis. And we've been following this letter, this revelation that Jesus gave to John and John copied it down and then put it in a letter. And that letter now is circulating to these seven churches. And we started in Ephesus and then we went to Smyrna and then we went to Pergamum. And last week we were in Thyatira. And so this week, we're gonna be looking at the city of Sardis and the church in Sardis. And as we've done every week before, we're gonna go back to that original conversation. Because remember, this book wasn't written to scare us, this book wasn't written to confuse us. If we go back and look at the original context between the author and the audience, we can gain a clear understanding of the message that we need to take, the application for today. And so today's application, I think, is gonna be really good as we jump into the city. And so let me start there. Let me start with some context, all right? The city of Sardis, it had several different names, Sard, Sephard, or, or Sardis. And the city was actually a pretty large city by the scale of the first century. There was nearly 100,000 people who lived in the city of Sardis. And the city of Sardis was known for their agricultural products. They're also known for their textiles. When you think of someone who is Greek walking around, what do you think that they're wearing? And I'm not talking about fraternity guys wearing Abercrombie and French or American Eagle. All right, I'm talking about somebody who's Greek. What do they typically wear? We know they wear togas. That's right. You can be confident. Togas, right? And so the city of Sardis was well known for making the very best togas in all of the Greco-Roman world. But the city of Sardis was really known for this, gold. That's right, there's gold and then there are hills, right? I mean, they had so much gold in the city of Sardis, which made them a very influential and very wealthy city. And so there are several things that are very unique about the city that I need to give you a little context for. Number one, the city of Sardis was built between two different mountains. 
And so it's located between in the valley between two large mountains. And so it gave it this incredible perspective of every single day. Uh, they would have shade from one of these mountains. And each of these mountains that were created kind of created dual uh, acropolises. Dual Acropolises, remember High City, or Acropolis, High City, it's where they would build all their government buildings, their temples, usually their citadels, their fortresses. And so in the city of Sardis, unlike any of the other cities, they didn't have one Acropolis, they actually had two, one on each side of the city. And so you look at one side of the city, you had the temples, you'd have the, the fortress, you'd have the, the, the government buildings. And when you see this side of the city, that's where all the life was. And so that was one of the Acropolises. But on the other one, it wasn't known as an Acropolis, it was known as a Necropolis. And the word neck and the, means death. So they had a city, a high city, but then they had a city of the dead. You see, the city of Sardis was infatuated with death. They were consumed with death. All things around death. They loved death. They celebrated death. And so they had these two dueling necropolises. One that was about life and one was a necropolis was about death. Now, in many of the Greek cities or Roman cities, they would have graveyards. But they would really be a graveyard right outside the city gates or right inside the city gates. But no, this city loved death and worshipped death so much that they had its own acropolis just for that. And so you had a city of life, you had the high city over here, you had the city of death in between was where all the people lived. And so in the year AD 17, 19, 21, 24, 29, and in AD 60, the city was hit with massive earthquakes. And in AD 60, it was a huge earthquake. It was well known throughout the whole Roman Empire about this massive earthquake that hit the city of Sardis and nearly destroyed the city. And what it did is that Acropolis it divided into three sections. One section after the earthquake kind of rumbled and fell off the back, but then another section in the front, a third fell off in the front, and it covered nearly 300 acres of residential homes, killing tens of thousands of people, living only, leaving only a third of that Acropolis there. And so massive, massive earthquake known by everyone. And if you like homework, here's your homework for this week, all right? All those like homework, all right? Go in the book of Revelation and see where this earthquake is referenced later in the book of Revelation. Because again, the book of Revelation isn't primarily about the future, isn't primarily about the end of the world. It's actually pointing backwards. And you'll see here this reference you'll see later in the book of Revelation. Now your homework for last week, Daniel 10. If you're wondering, so I don't get emails and texts, you forgot to tell us, Daniel 10 was the answer for last week. And so this massive earthquake hits the city and really defines this city going forward, especially at the time that this letter was written. You're gonna see that here in a couple of minutes. Now the city was found by the Lydians. The Lydians, the first king of the city, the Lydian people was a guy by the name of Gugu. Yeah, Gugu, like you sound like a baby, like Gugu, but he's not a baby, you don't mess with this guy. In fact, the Hebrews called him Gog. Gog, and the guy that followed him, the second king, was Magog. And so if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you get to the battle of Armageddon, and it references Gog and Magog. Once again, he's not pointing to the future, he's pointing to the past. And so the most well-known king uh, in this Lydian city of Sardis was a king by the name of Cretius, King Cretius. And King Cretius was loaded. He was incredibly wealthy. He had a ton of gold. In fact, the legend is this, that he met King Midas. You know who Midas is, right? The guy who had the Midas touch. Everything he touched turned to gold. And the legend is King Midas washed his hands in the, in the river leading into the city of Sardis. And so all things in that river turned to gold and came to King Cretius. And King Cretius was very wealthy and he built the city up and he spent a lot of money and a lot of time building the citadel on top of the Acropolis. Because he wanted to make sure that the city was impenetrable. That no matter who came against them, no matter what enemy came against them, that they could stand. And so he built taller walls. He created the, a cistern so they had water and a food source up there so they could withstand any enemy anytime. This is a city who could never, ever be defeated. And so what we see is the Persians come on the scene, the same Persians that took out Israel. Uh, the Persians come into this neck of the woods. And so King Cretius uh, goes to the oracle in Delphi and asks the oracle, should I go to battle? And the oracle gave uh, him an answer and said, there was going to be a great people who will no longer exist. And King Cretius, it was so narcissistic. He's like, well, that's not me. It must be them. And so he decides to go to battle. And he goes to battle against the Persians and they end in a draw. 
And so King Cretius takes his army back to the city of Sardis, but the Persians follow behind him. And when he sees the Persians follow behind them, he rallies his, his, his infantry. He rallies his, his horses, and they jump on their horses to go out to attack the Persians. But the Persians weren't riding horses, they were riding camels. And so King Cretius' horses have never seen or smelled camels before. And so when they go out and they have this confrontation, the horses freak out when they see and smell these camels and he is defeated. And so he retreats back into the citadel that he built, this impenetrable fortress on top of this Acropolis. And they are surrounded by the Persians. And as the legend goes, one day one of his soldiers fell asleep on the edge of the outer wall. And when he fell asleep, he tilted his head forward and his helmet fell off and tumbled down the mountain. And one of the Persian soldiers saw this. And next thing he knew, that guy disappeared. And then a few minutes later, reappeared. And guess what he had when he reappeared? He had his helmet. He put it back on, which signaled to this Persian, there must be a secret entrance. And so that very night where all the people in Sardis were, were sound asleep, confident, Confident that no one would ever be able to penetrate these walls. That night, the Persians found that secret entrance, snuck into the city, and took the city. The city that should have been safe, the city that should have been secure, the city that was built to be impenetrable, was defeated. They came in while they slept and took the city. Now the Persians took the city, and from the city of, of Sardis, they built a major road all the way back to the capital of their uh, kingdom, uh, which would have been the city of Susa. And what you see at this stage in time is many Jews begin leaving the city of Susa and making their way and living now in the city of Sardis. Why? Read the book of Esther, all right? Do that this afternoon, no Jack's game. You can read that this afternoon, all right? Uh, and that's the reason why. But you think, you would think after one time they learned their lesson, right? Wrong. They didn't learn their lesson because a second time. Now fast forward 200 years and uh, Alexander the Great takes over this part of the world and he gives this area of the world to one of his general, a guy by the name of Seleucus, who last week when we studied the, the city of Thyatira, he's the one who created, started, founded the city of Thyatira. And so Alexander the Great gave this city to his general, but the king of the city at the time is like, no, I'm not leaving. I like my gold, I like my stuff, and so I'm gonna do what King Cretius did. I'm gonna go up into the citadel, I'm gonna shut the doors, and I'm gonna wake the Greeks out. And so something similar happened a second time. A second time, the story goes, uh, they were up there and a donkey had died, and so they pushed the donkey over the edge of the wall, and as the Greeks were watching this happen, what they noticed were all the buzzards, all the buzzards that began to circle above. All the birds, buzzards who began to come down and, and feed on the carcass of this donkey. And all of those buzzards were seated on a portion of the wall, which told the Greeks there was nobody defending that portion of the wall. And so that night while everyone was asleep, that night where they were in their impenetrable fortress, sound asleep, not worried about the enemy, not worried about what could happen. That very night, the Greeks scaled the wall, went over the wall in that very spot. And for a second time while they were asleep, took the city. And so you think they learned their lesson, right? The lesson is this, your city is not impenetrable. It could have been, but, but if it wasn't for the fact that they, they were not vigilant, they were not diligent to uphold their, their, what they needed to. And so now that city was taken. They became a little, a bit lazy. They became a little bit comfortable, and so their city was taken. So now it becomes a Roman city, and you see this Roman influence begin to come in. And so that doesn't just affect things outside the church and society. It begins to affect things within the church. And you see a little of this paganism beginning to make its way inside of the very church, where they're not just dealing with society things or societal issues. Now it's theology. It's the core, it's the bedrock of, of the church. And you see those things beginning to drift. You see this whole, you know, let's just get along. Let's just tolerate one another. You do you, you I'll do me. I mean, we're all going in the same place, all same plane anyway. And so let's just kind of merge all of this together. And you see that seed beginning to take root in this church. Because what's really interesting about this city, and Harvard has done a phenomenal job uh, doing a ton of work in the city of Sardis. They found the second largest gymnasium in all the Roman world. The biggest was in Ephesus. This is a five acre gymnasium. And when I say gymnasium, don't think about like your gym at school, all right? Think about a college. I mean, really what a gymnasium was in this Greco-Roman world, it was like a combination of a library and a MMA training center. That's what it was. 
Right? And so you would have this five acre area with all these different classrooms where they would go study philosophy, they'd go study war techniques, they'd go study leadership, they would go study whatever, but then they would go out in the yard and they would battle hand to hand or use swords and they would learn all of these incredible skills. And so huge, second largest, it was like a university. It was massive, it was massive. And so in the city, if you wanted to know something, this is where you went. You didn't go to the barber shop, you didn't go to the hair salon, you didn't jump on uh, uh, social media. If you wanted to go and you had a new book, you wanted to go share it, you would go to the gymnasium. If you wanted to go hear the latest gossip, you would go to the gymnasium. If you're a politician running for office, you want to kind of get your message out, you go to the gym gymnasium. If you want to go and debate different philosophy, you would go to the gymnasium. If you want to go complain about your football team, <clears throat> you go to the gymnasium, all right? And so everyone would go here, and this gymnasium was absolutely incredible. And it had a huge bathhouse. I think you got a picture of the, the entrance to the bathhouse. It's massive. It's beautiful. And so ornate, tiled, beautiful, beautiful campus. It's like a Harvard-level college. But here's what's really unique. Only time in history you've ever seen this. Attached to this Roman gymnasium is a synagogue. There's a picture on the bottom left. You'll see about a, uh, a synagogue that's uh, about the, the size of two basketball courts. And here's what you need to know. This is the largest synagogue in the entire Gentile world. The largest synagogue. You're like, why in the world, in the city of Sardis, is there a large synagogue? Now, what's a synagogue? A synagogue, uh, during the time where they were in exile in Babylon, they didn't have the temple. The temple was destroyed. And so the Jews who were not in Israel, not in Jerusalem, they were in Babylon. What they would do is they would build these things called a synagogue. It was basically a community center where they would get together and they would celebrate their Jewish feast. They would celebrate their Jewish heritage. They would read the law and study the law together. It was a place where they could come together and hold on to their Jewish roots. And so why in the world is the largest synagogue in the entire Gentile world in the city of Sardis? Read the book, Esther. <laughs> all right? Because they all made their way from this area of Babylon and Persia and Susa, and they ended up in the city of Sardis, and they built this massive synagogue. And so what does that mean? It means when this church started, when this city began, here you have the second largest gymnasium attached to the largest synagogue. Those two things should never go together, but they are. And so in the city of Sardis, there is a legacy. I mean, there are buildings that are being built. There is a history here. There is a foundation here that even in this Roman world, the, the study of God's word was a key part of what they were teaching everybody in this gymnasium. Huge, but as you start to look a little closer, those seeds of compromise, they started to work their way into the church, not just in culture, not just in the social things around the church, they started to make their way into the church because you look up here at the synagogue and you look at uh, the altar in the synagogue, you see a couple things. Number one on the altar, you see an eagle with a thunderbolt. You know what that's symbolic for? The Roman Empire. That is the symbol of Caesar Augustus. And so on the very altar of God, they have this symbol for Caesar Augustus. And adjacent to the altar, you see four of these same things. They are not dogs, they are lions. And they are lions, and those lions are symbolic for the god Zeus. And so what you see is what happened in culture, what was going on in the city of Sardis outside of the walls of this church began to find its ways inside of this church and impact their very worship. Where here they are in the house of God and they brought in Caesar Augustus and Zeus. So they're not living missionally, evidently. And maybe what they're thinking is, you know what, if I bring my Gentile friend to church with me, I wanna make sure they're comfortable at church. I don't, wanna, I don't want them to, to feel like they're out of place. And so what, let's do this. Let's, let's just bring in some, some, some pictures, some symbols, some, some carvings of things uh, that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with. Let's just kind of work it in together. And maybe we'll knock the faces of the lions off so that they're not going to look like idols. But we know what they mean. And so maybe what they were doing here is they were just trying to compromise, just trying to coexist, trying to get along. And you see this affecting the people here in the city, in this church, in Sardis in a huge way. One last thing I'm gonna share with you before we jump in the letter, and I promise I know it's a lot of context, but it's all gonna come together today, let me tell you. And so in the city, they had a patron God. Remember, patron God was the God of the entire city. And so everybody in the city had to worship this God. And it was a goddess, actually, by the name of Kibbola. Kibbola, and Kibbola eventually becomes Artemis. You've heard of Artemis. They worshiped her in the city of 
Ephesus. And so Kibla built this, they built a massive temple for Kibla. It was the fourth largest temple in the world. And it was situated right down in that valley between those two different mountains. And literally, you can be sitting in this temple and framed out the right door. You look out the right side and you see this, this, this Acropolis that was a symbolic for life. And at the door on the left, framed would be this other mountain, the Necropolis, the city of the dead. You can literally be sitting in this temple and look one way and see life and look the other way and see death. And it was really interesting what happened at this temple because this plays a part of the story, not just for the people of Sardis, but every one of these seven churches because every single year there was a festival to this goddess Kibla. And a million plus people would come all together into the city of Sardis. And they would come from all these other seven churches that we're talking about. They would come from all over the Greco-Roman world and they would come to the city of Sardis where they would recreate the, the myth behind this goddess Kibla. And the goddess Kibla, she was a, 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 a female goddess who had both female and male genitalia. She could procreate on her own. And so the legend goes that she had a grandson who was infatuated with her and wanted to be with her, but she didn't want to be with him. And so what he did as an incredible act of worship, a sacrificial worship, is he castrated himself and he put his male parts on the altar as a symbol of worship and sacrifice. And so what would happen then is millions of people would come to the city of Sardis every single year and they would dress in the finest white togas they could find. And they would start in the city center where they would be there together and they would start with a whole lot of alcohol and they would start walking. They would be on this journey all the way to this temple. And the goal was to either work themselves in such a, a lather or drink enough alcohol that when they reached the temple that they would reenact this myth of Kibla, and that they would as well castrate themselves just like her grandson did. And so, and the legend was that if you did that to yourself and you got blood on yourself, that you would be blessed. Now, not everybody, <laughs> not everybody took part in this, but here was the story. The story was this, if you didn't take part, but the person next to you did, and their blood got on your white, clean clothes, then their sacrifice counted for you. And so that is the backdrop. That is the context of what's going on in the city of Sardis. And all of that matters as we're about to jump in because here's a city that had a name, they had a reputation. They built these incredible buildings that were well known. They had a history, they had a legacy. They started so well. But what you're gonna hear right off the bat is they're no longer that church anymore. And so let's jump in, Revelation chapter three, uh, picking up in verse one and see this message that Jesus wrote to this church in Sardis. Verse one says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. We know what that means. He's the one in control. He says, I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but... You are dead. On the count of three, let's say dead together. One, two, three. They were a dead church. Thank you up there. Yes, they were a dead church. He says, you have a name, you have a reputation. You've done some things in your past. There are buildings built. There's a legacy. The whole world's gonna know of what you've done, but you're not that church anymore. You're not those people anymore. Somewhere along the way, you took your foot off the gas and you're no longer alive. You are dead. And so remember some of the history I gave you as we continue to read these words. Verse two, he starts out and Jesus says, wake up. Say wake up with me on the count of three. One, two, three, wake up. Again, making sure you're awake. But to this church who has a history of falling asleep, his words are, wake up. And he doesn't just say it once. Listen, he's gonna say it again. Wake up, strengthen what little remains for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. I mean, there's a lack of diligence. There's a lack of vigilance by this church. They started great. They were on fire, on fire for the word of God, but now they're living off their past. Now they're living off their reputation. Now they're being careless 
no longer diligent, no longer vigilant to hold on to the word of God, no longer diligent or vigilant to hold on to the truth. They're not living distinctly. They're starting to look like everyone else around them. They're not being who Jesus called them to be, a light, a city on a hill. And so he says, verse three, he says, go back. Church, go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Say hold to it on the count of three. One, two, three. Hold to it. He said hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. And if you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. And so again, here's the church that started well. Here's a church that has the largest synagogue in the Gentile world. Here is a church that has that synagogue attached to the second largest world-class gymnasium in the whole Roman Empire. He says, remember, remember your story. Remember your heritage. Remember your legacy. Remember the foundation of this church. It's what you were taught in that synagogue. So go back to where you started, go back to your roots, go back to when you were faithful. Remember what you heard, remember the truth of the word of God and hold on to it, hold on to it. I mean, this seems to be a church that started so well, a church that has this incredible, incredible legacy. They were committed to scriptures, but somewhere along the way, somewhere throughout their story, they took their foot off the gas, they began to compromise and allow things to the outside to work their way to the inside, and they let go, and they're no longer living for Jesus. They're not alive, they're dead. And Jesus says, no, go back. Go back to what you had at first, and hold on to that. And listen, this seems to be a people who were living off of yesterday, living off of last year's fast, living off of last year's quiet time, living off of last year's CIY, living off of last year's you know, small group, living off of last year's generosity, living off of last year's service, living off the past, not living off the present. No longer diligent, no longer vigilant. But what I love about Jesus is in every single one of these letters, yes, he calls them out, but he makes a way for them to return. He gives grace, he gives mercy. He says, yes, this is where you are. Remember, hold on, but repent. You can come back to me. You can come back to me. As he says, if you don't, you don't, you don't wake up, I'm gonna come like a thief in the night. And do you think that city understood that context? He said, wake up twice. How many times did they fall asleep and get invaded? Not once, but twice. Listen, text, context, it is speaking to this crowd. They are hearing this message. Wake up, don't do what your ancestors did. Don't do what your forefathers did. You think you're safe, you think you're secure, you think you've you're got everything you need. Listen, I'm going to sneak in like a thief in the night if you don't wake up. So remember, hold on and repent if necessary. Now, not everything in the city is bad. Not everybody in this church is bad. Listen to some of the good things Jesus says in verse four. He says, there are some, some in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. Does that not speak? Does that speak to what they are dealt with? He says, they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Listen, the city known for these garments, the city known for these white togas, a city known for this festival to the goddess Kibbola. He said, remember, there are some that have held on and remained pure. There's some who lived distinctly. There's some that have held to my holiness. There are some that have remained faithful. And to them, all who are victorious, verse five, will be clothed in white. And I will never erase their names from the book of life but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. I mean, what a statement Jesus is making to us. Saying to us, if we remain faithful, that we will be dressed in white and that our names will never be removed from the book of life. They will be added. And understand what that spoke to this audience. An audience that if they did not participate in this festival to the goddess of Kibbola, they would have been taken into the city square and the government officials would have came and they would have opened this massive book with every single resident of the city of Sardis in there. And because they did not participate, their names would have been wiped out, taken out, no longer a citizen forgotten, abandoned, removed. And then Jesus says, no, your name will never be removed from my book. And not only that, 
I will go before my father and I will be the herald. I will be the one who announces you. I will be your hype man before my father and let him know that you are the faithful. What a word from Jesus. What encouragement from Jesus to those who remember and hold on and repent. And he ends with these words that Jesus says when he teaches an important lesson every time. Verse six, anyone with ears must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Jesus says this after every one of his messages to these seven churches. Jesus says this, if you go through the gospels, after every one of his key teaching, he says, listen, if you've got ears, you need to listen because what I'm telling you, these are the words of life. These are the words of life. And so that's the background of this, this letter to the city, this church in Sardis. And I think there's a lot we can learn from this city. I mean, the city that, and a church who had a history of faithfulness, yet they took their foot off the gas, they just coasted, they lived off the past, they lived off their reputation, and they, they no longer were diligent, they no longer were vigilant, and they needed to lean in. They needed to press in to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so does any of this apply to us? Does any of this apply to, to me? Does any of this apply to you? I mean, are we committed, committed to the word of God? Are we daily, diligently living distinctly for Jesus Christ? Are we abiding in Jesus? Are we making disciples? Are we identifying the sin in our lives and doing our best to uproot that sin? Are we living as the community of God, vigilant and dig diligent and holding on the truth and not letting compromise and culture work its way into our lives and into our church? Because we can't live off the past. We can't live off of a legacy. We can't live off of, of last year's stuff or our last decade stuff. We've got to constantly, day by day, be, be renewed in Jesus Christ. I mean, this is what discipleship is all about. It's why the word disciple, the definition we use is you gotta be transformed. It's not a one-time thing. It's not the moment you get baptized, you make a decision for Jesus to follow him. You now begin this lifelong journey of being transformed to look more and more like Jesus. And that process is not linear. It's circular. It never, ever comes to an end. So we've gotta be a disciple. And so are we building monuments to the past? Are we pass passionately pursuing all that Jesus has for us now? Listen, God doesn't care about, about monuments and buildings. What God cares about is people. He cares about building disciples, making disciples. And if all we care about is building more buildings, all we care about is, is our name and our legacy, then God is gonna look elsewhere for someone else to do what he needs them to do. And so I think we live in a time, I think we live in, in a culture, I think we live in a country that we can identify with these people in Sardis because we live in a time where, where there's a lot of compromise. Well, there's a lot of things from the outside making their way to the inside of the church. And the attitude is, well, let's just get along. Let's just coexist. I mean, let them do their thing. We'll just do our thing. And isn't it really all the same anyway? Aren't we all just kind of on the same path, going to the same direction? So let's just love everybody. <laughs> yes, church, we should absolutely love everybody. But loving everybody doesn't mean we have to agree with their theology. We have to hold Tight, what Jesus said, hold tight. And yes, Jesus is abundantly clear. Please hear me when I say this. Jesus says, you will know, the world will know that you are my disciple by the way you love. Jesus says that we should love others the way that he loved us. Jesus in the great command said, love God and love others. I don't think Jesus could be more abundantly clear that we need to love other people. But loving other people doesn't mean we need to compromise and allow bad theology into our lives or into our church. We have to hold on. We have to hold on to the truth. We have to hold on to the word of God. We have to hold on to the gospel. We have to hold on to the kingdom and the kingdom ways. So remember, hold on. And if necessary, repent. Repent, listen, our lives, what we believe, people can see it. I mean, I can look at your life and you can probably look at my life and if I can watch you long enough, I can probably tell you exactly what you believe. And if you look at my life, hopefully you'll be able to look at my life and be able to, to, to make a pretty good educated guess of what I believe. And John was abundantly clear in his first letter. He said, we are not supposed to love the world. 
No, and so Jesus is a 100% saying that we are not to, to just coexist. We are not to just, you know, to compromise and live in this. Let's all just get along culture. What he's saying is we, as his disciples, need to live distinctly. Distinctly. And that's a challenge. Because living as a disciple of Jesus in this crazy world we're living in is a challenge. Because of what it puts us in is this tension, this tension in our life of dressing these things in our world with this tension between truth and grace. And church, I'm just gonna tell you, we're never not gonna be in this tension. We are, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, living in the world, in the country, in the culture we're living, we are always gonna be in this tension between truth and grace. And the reality is, how do we then deal with that person who does not believe what I believe? How do I deal with a classmate? How do I deal with a coworker? How do I have a difficult conversation? How do I deal with that person sitting at my dinner table every single night? How do I deal with that family member showing up at Christmas or, or, or Thanksgiving or at family reunions? How do I deal how do I deal with them with truth and grace? And church, the answer is this. By sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning what does it mean to be his disciple. By sitting at the feet of our rabbi and letting the dust off his shoes blow into our lives so that we can learn who Jesus is and we can do our very best to be like him and love like him and lead like him and deal with this tension between truth and grace just like him. But church, we can't do that if we're just visiting Jesus. We have to abide in Jesus. That word abide means to remain, it means to sit, it means to settle, it means to rest. And man, that is the call that Jesus has on your life and my life. And we're gonna be his disciples, that we have to abide in him, rest in him, remain in him. And as we do, we grow more and more and more like him. But the reality in my life, and maybe it's not my life, maybe it's your life too, that sometimes I just visit Jesus. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I open my Bible and I read a passage and 15 minutes later, I don't even remember what I read. Or sometimes I get up in the morning, I get my phone out and I read that daily Bible reading plan so I can push that button and get my streak to 32 days in a row, right? Or sometimes I get up in the morning and I open my Bible in that quiet time and I don't look at it as the inspired word of God, I look at it as a textbook, as a tool for me to put a message together for you. Or sometime I get in my prayer time and I just start wandering, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Right, and I end up just visiting Jesus. Or sometimes I just come to church to check it off the box, to get my 60, 65 minutes in, to say I visited Jesus today. We are never gonna be who God needs us to be in this culture, in this country, just visiting Jesus. We have to abide in Jesus. And church, let me just tell you, this isn't gonna get easier. It's gonna get more and more and more difficult because the reality is the world we're living in, the culture and country we're living in, we're living in a post-Christian world where more people don't believe Jesus than ever before. And listen, election after election at the county level, the state level, the federal level, they're gonna continue to remove more and more of the freedoms that we have enjoyed. And I know we, we lament that and we, we're sorrow for that, but can I just be candid with you? This is just me, just my thought is maybe that's the best thing for the church in America. Because maybe that's Jesus going, wake up, wake up. You thought you had a legacy, you thought you had a past, you've built monument after monument, building after building, but what have you done lately, church? You know, maybe that is Jesus' way to wake up the church in America. Because the reality is when that happens, what's gonna happen is we'll know who's in, who's out. There won't be, you know, hey, I'm, I'm walking the light, but I'm doing a little bit gray and I'm staying out of the dark. No, you're either in or you're out. And the church, the church, every time it's persecuted, it thrives. Why? Because it becomes abundantly clear who is in and who is out. And so we can lament this, or church, we can look at this as an incredible opportunity for us to be who we were called to be. It's a chance to bring grace. It's a chance to bring truth. It's a chance to bring love. It's a chance to bring forgiveness. It's a chance to bring mercy. It's a chance to bring the word of God. It's a chance to bring the gospel. It's a chance to bring Jesus. It's a chance to bring his church. It's a chance to bring his kingdom. And it is a chance for us to bring heaven to earth in those dark places. And so church, Maybe it is for a time as such as this. And so maybe the message to the church of Sardis is very applicable to us. Wake up, wake up. Don't rest on your past. 
It's not what you did yesterday, it's what are you doing today? And listen, I know it's easy to look at this church and go, you know what, <laughs> glad it's not me. <laughs> it is, just so you know, it is. This is us. But I think this is an incredible opportunity for us to be exactly the church that we were created to be. And so how do we live at this intersection of, of culture in Christ? Let me wrap all this together with a picture. I'm gonna throw this up on the screen, take you back to the city of Sardis. There's that temple to Kibbola or Artemis. And I want you to notice that building there in the far left-hand bottom corner. That was a building built maybe 150 years after this letter to this church in Sardis in Revelation. It was built by Christians. Literally built, attached to the temple of Kibbola. And I stood in that building a little over a year ago with 24 people here from Christ Church. And it's not very big, it's actually pretty small. And so those experts at Harvard who are doing all the research there and all the archeology span there said more than likely it wasn't a church because it was too small to gather the people together. Here's more than likely what it was, a hospital. It was a hospital. The Christians in the city of Sardis every single year would see this festival where people would go to this temple and do horrible things to themselves. And who was going to be there for them when they did that? They said, it's our job as the church to be there. It's our job as, as the people of God to be there for those people when they need us the most. And man, I don't know about you, but I saw that there and I've been moved by the people in Sardis because I think that is the church that Jesus wants us to be. That's the people that Jesus wants us to be. We're not afraid to go to the dark places, not afraid to go to the people who not, not look like us, vote like us, talk like us, believe like us, but not afraid to go there because it's who we're called to be. They planted a church at the very gates of hell to help people, to bring healing, to bring hope to a culture and a world that was struggling. I don't know about you, but that moves me. That moves me to go, that's someone who paid attention to the message that Jesus wrote them in the city of Sardis. To remember, to hold on, and to repent. And so maybe every single one of us today need to take some time to just reflect. Man, am I on fire for Jesus? Am I abiding in Jesus or am I just visiting Jesus? Because if we're gonna do what we gotta do in this culture, in this world, it's gonna take a spirit just like that spirit of that church in Sardis, willing to go to the dark places, willing to go and build a church adjacent to a pagan temple. That is what Jesus has called his church to be. Would you pray with me, friends? Jesus, we thank you so much for these, these letters that you wrote to these churches. And it's easy to look at these and look at them as history or look at them just in the context, but to lose sight of the powerful, powerful message that were involved in these words. And so I thank you for this church in Sardis. I thank you for those in the church of Sardis who Jesus, listen, who had ears to hear and heard your message about waking up and remembering and holding on and if necessary, repenting. And it led them to a place where they're willing to go into dark places to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that in my life, Jesus, because I know it's so easy for me to get busy, to get preoccupied, and to maybe drift and take my foot off the gas. But Jesus, I wanna finish well. I wanna finish the race that's marked out for me. And I pray that prayer over everyone in this room, that they'll be willing to, to finish the race marked out for them. And what it's gonna require is daily sitting at your feet, Jesus, to become more and more like you. So Jesus, give us ears to hear today because maybe this message is for every single one of us in this room. And maybe the message is, wake up. Wake up, church. I need you to be a church willing to go to the dark places, willing to take the light of Jesus into a dark world and a dark culture. Jesus, we love you and we know we can't do this without you. The only way that we're going to be able to live at that intersection of culture and Christ, of truth and grace, is because we are your disciples. So help us to follow you, be transformed by you, and to be on mission with you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray, amen. Let's go ahead and stand.
Praise God together as one the church that Jesus is leading. And as we reflect on the cross this morning, you were given a little packet when you came in it's for communion, the elements for communion, just a little wafer and a little cup of juice. And it's just a chance for us to do this together to remind ourselves and be reminded of the work of the cross and the work of Jesus and his obedience to God the Father. So I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna lead us through this moment here together. We'll take the bread first and then we'll take the juice. Let's just bow our hearts again and I'll pray. Thank you, God, for just this moment for sending your son to die for us, for his body that was put upon a cross, that was beaten and that was sacrificed, raised up for all the world to see for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins and newness of life. And so we take this, this bread, this wafer, to remember Jesus and his body. Let's take the bread together.
and the juice in this cup. It's not magical juice, but it is a beautiful symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. It washes our sins, washes us white as snow. And so we take this cup to remember Jesus and his blood that was shed for us so that we can have forgiveness of sins. Let's take the cup. Well, thank you so much for coming today. It's been so, so good to worship with you this morning. Uh, if you wanna connect or give, you can hit the CC tags in front of you. If you need some prayer, we have wonderful folks that will meet you up here at the front to pray with you, so please hang out. If there's something stirring in your heart you wanna pray about, then they'll pray with you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Have a safe rest of your day, restful weekend, and great week ahead.